ג'ייסון פונטין, ומדבר על עשר הטכנולוגיות המבטיחות לשנת 2011. בכל שנה ה-MIT Technology Review מציין עשר טכנולוגיות שהוא חושב שתהיינה הטכנולוגיות המשפיעות ביותר, ואנחנו תכף נראה את הבחירה של השנה שכבר התפרסמה ב-Technology Review וגם הייתה להתייחסות בישראל. ג'ייסון, in the past have you been... Uh, If you look back at your predictions, how successful were they? <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, generally speaking, fairly suc successful, though our lack of success has traditionally come from being uh, too optimistic. In the short term, people tend to overestimate the power of technology to change the world, and in the long term, we tend to underestimate it. Technologies tend to um, over overturn things much more dramatically than people expect. So, um, if I could have a little switcheroo, which is somewhere there. There it is. So, I'm going to talk to you about our 10 technology picks for 2011. You are the first audience who has seen these. They are live on the site from a couple of, of weeks ago. So, the first question is, how do we select the, uh, the 10 technologies? Well, not tea leaves or looking at the livers of, of chickens, um, but usually using three criteria by and large. So the first thing we look for are genuinely hard civilizational problems, intractable problems that have stymied the ability of human beings to come up with, with solutions. Um, and we discussed some of those problems this morning. How can we make solar Uh, energy into a power that is cheap to generate, easy to store, and simple to transmit. But it's not enough to simply find a hard problem. We look for elegant solutions, because elegant solutions are often solutions that have the greatest potential to be commercialized. And then finally, we look for solutions that would have genuinely large-scale impact whether that impact was commercial uh, or political or social. So without further ado, here are Technology Review's top picks for this year's most interesting technologies. So social indexing. I'm going to talk about each of the 10 technologies in the way I just described, in terms of the problem, the solution, and the impact. So here's the problem. Um, search engines struggle to predict what information an, informa an individual will find most relevant. For the last 12 years, essentially, we have used the same basic mechanism for uh, understanding the Internet. And that model, that paradigm, has been search. And the Google search algorithm, PageRank, essentially works in a very simple way. It counts the numbers of links into a web page as a proxy for relevancy. But it's not very human, and it doesn't take into account really the history of your previous preferences, nor the preferences of your friends. So the solution has been, was invented by this gentleman, Brett Taylor at Facebook, who is one of the founders at FriendFeed. He's replacing, or perhaps I should say supplementing, the existing search paradigm of the internet with social indexing. So all of you have seen this in its most uh, rudimentary fashion as the like button on Facebook pages. But you've also, I'm sure, begun to notice this gradual proliferation of social indexing as the principal new mechanism of uh, traveling around the web. When you visit media pages, there's the somewhat startling scene of the other pages that your friends in your Facebook network have read. Or you go to Amazon, Uh, and it suggested that you might like a certain singer because your friends have liked it. I don't believe that this, as I say, replaces search, but I think it, I think it adds to search on the grounds that the web becomes better if it's more human. Um, the impact? Well, it has a number of important impacts. Search is increasingly manipulated. Search is increasingly subject to search engine optimization um, and doesn't always provide the best results. 
and for my industry at least, publishing, it provides a way to make advertising more efficient and therefore to perhaps uh, support much of the content that you like to read. Smart transformers. We talked a bit about this this morning, which is the inability of the modern uh, grid to behave intelligently. So the problem is that smart grids can't fulfill their potential until they can reroute the flow of electricity house by house. What we want is a electrical grid that's more like the internet. An electrical grid that can respond to spikes and dips in demand and that energy produced by a house can be added to the grid um, and vice versa. So the solution is, as I was talking this morning, is uh, a different kind of transformer. So we want a grid that essentially is based upon different materials. A at the level of the grid itself, it would be nice to have superconducting um, uh, AC so that energy moved less efficiency loss. But what we also want is a grid at the level of the house which can balance supply and demand within neighborhoods. It can't be done with silicon for a variety of reasons. This is still only working in the lab, but Alex Swung at North Carolina State University has made a smart grid. This is different from the smart meter. This doesn't attempt to it doesn't attempt to go and change the demand curve in the house, but it makes the grid itself more intelligent. The impact, well, we talked about this this morning, to adapt uh, residential solar cells and fleets of electric vehicles. Fewer power plants will be needed to handle the spikes in demand. I don't think we get to a truly new energy system until the industrial grid itself has been replaced. Gestural interfaces. This technology comes from Israel. So, uh, the problem, it's difficult to interface with increasingly complex computers that you find in cars or mobile devices, in televisions, kiosks. What we want is a new interface that replaces or is an addition to the point and click interface that we've been using for at least 25 years. It comes from this guy. Alexander Schapunt at Prime Sense, a camera that senses depth and distinguishes a user's gestures from the background, allowing users to control a computer without buttons. This exists in a product many of you have already seen. This was the core technology inside Microsoft's Kinect. But I think eventually uh, the technology in Prime Sense will actually create a whole list of applications that we haven't even seen yet. So the impact isn't simply making televisions and the like easier to use. The impact, I think, is a whole new range of applications that we can't even begin to, to imagine now. Um, Alex is a great guy, so um, a small way that Israeli technology, hardly recognized as such in the States, is, is already changing the world. Cancer genomics. This is, I think, the biggest breakthrough in terms of the treatment of cancer uh, in my lifetime. As I take you through the problem, it will astonish you that um, no one had solved this before. So the problem is that, amazingly, we don't know the genetic mutations inside individual cancers. So cancer is a very simple thing, right? The uh, genetic damage, DNA damage, accumulates inside a cell and it begins to replicate uh, crazily. And even though we have got to the point where we can, could begin a few years ago to sequence a person's genome until very recently we hadn't sequenced the, the genome of individual cancers. So we didn't actually know why um, a cell was beginning to mutate crazily. Um, not knowing why a cancer is behaving as it does means that it's very difficult to choose a appropriate uh, treatment. We just heard about that in the last treatment. Let me give you a really good example. Genentech, the American biotech firm, has a treatment for a particular mutation of breast cancer that is 100% effective. It is a cure. Uh, the drug is called Herceptin, but it only is applicable to about 25% of women who have cancer because they have a particular mutation. At the moment, the only way we can really tell whether or not a woman is an appropriate candidate